We hope this day finds everyone doing well. If you are visiting with us this evening, we certainly want to thank you for being here, and I hope you'll give us an opportunity to get to know you and also uh, an opportunity to get to know us. Now, if you're paying close attention, you'll recognize that this morning's scripture reading was the same as the scripture reading this evening. That was not planned. And I have to say that when I realize that I'm sitting over in the pew and I'm just a little uncomfortable for the first few minutes, am I going to have to write a new sermon or is this going to be enough of a difference that uh, we'll be able to go with it? Well, it turns out, thankfully, it's enough of a difference. So we're going to go ahead and speak on the subject of redeeming our time. And the irony of this is a few months ago, me and Tyler were having lunch and he had posed an idea of, you know, it'd really be interesting if we had one scripture, one passage, and had several men preach on that same passage, and how different the sermons would be. Well, how ironic that it's happening today, and it was not even planned. So, what is interesting about that, though, and I was thinking about the book of Philemon, and if you recall, Onesimus leaves Philemon, and he finds himself with Paul, and as Paul is sending Onesimus back to Philemon, uh, he says, you know, he's been here, and he's actually been ministering to me, but now you're going to have a brother, a brother in Christ. Well, in verse 15 of that passage, or the, of the Philemon, it says here, for perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose that you might receive him forever. I find that word perhaps. So I'm going to say that What's going on this evening with two lessons having to do with redeeming our time, perhaps there is a higher purpose for this. So, but anyway, once again, it's good to see everyone here, and I always uh, thank Ken for the opportunity to, uh, to fill in for him. So as we introduce our subject this evening, in 1936, the uh, noted American poet, writer, and editor Carl Sandburg, he wrote this very lengthy poem. In fact, it was the length of a book, some 300 pages. And the title of this poem is called The People, Yes. And it was published at a time this country was just coming through the worst years of the Great Depression. And it lauds the perseverance of the American people. And he uses folklore. He uses such people as Paul Bunyan in this in terms of representing this perseverance of the American spirit. However, it also sums up the history of humanity that were born we go through a life of troubles, and then there is death. And unfortunately, this depressing description is close to the mark than most of us may be willing to admit when it comes to our attitudes and life. However, life is meant to be more than an endless and mindless treadmill. Jesus would say in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. That word abundantly there, this bountiful blessings overflowing only deity can provide. It's a never ceasing supply of life. So concerning the context of that passage there, many were not literally thieves, yet were careless in their duty, and by their neglect the flock was affected. Basically, bad principles are really the root of bad practices. And so this abundance of life that's given to us I would say that includes also how we use our time. Are we responsible in using our time as Christians? So the point to be made here is that where there is really maybe little purpose, a little hope with people in life, or even for someone who's a Christian and we're distracted, um, we carelessly use our time sometimes for destructive behavior, and oftentimes it's just not ourselves but others. So time is... I've always been fascinated with that subject here in the Bible. And so we have the opportunity this evening to look once again at the subject of redeeming our time. And that's in verse 16 of Ephesians 5, but I want to go ahead and look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 17, and then as we go through there, we'll make some applications. But the first 21 verses of Ephesians chapter 5, we are to live a life of moral integrity. That's what Paul is imploring to the Ephesian church as well as to us some 2,000 years later. And so in our scripture reading in Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 15, he says here, see then that you walk circumspectly. He's saying here, walk carefully and to do that continuously, not as fools, but as wise, 
redeeming the time because the days are evil. This is the incentive of redeeming our time because the days are evil. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, Paul says there that the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the disobedient. So we live in troubled times, and it's important how we're going to use our time. He continues here in verse 17, Therefore do not be wise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So this understanding is from the word of God. Paul would write to the Colossians in chapter 1, verse 9, Be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And earlier in the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, he says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So we want to concentrate on that verse, redeeming the time. In the New American Standard, and I think the English Standard Version, it says, Make the best use of your time. But in a minute... I want us to look at that Greek term for redeeming because that was the whole reason that I took an interest in the subject. It's a very interesting interpretation in terms of what that meaning is. But basically in these three verses, we're to walk carefully, we're to make the best use of our time, and we're to possess an understanding of God's word. Well, as mentioned in the Gospels, we are to live a life, a sacrificial life. And just like uh, what was pointed out this morning with Tyler, But that sacrifice also includes our time. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 38, Jesus says there, And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. This is really the first time that the cross is mentioned in the gospel accounts. And the imagery here is drawn from the Roman practice of forcing a condemned criminal to carry his own cross to crucifixion. It's a symbol of suffering, it's a symbol of shame, and ultimately of death. Here, for us, it is a sacrifice one must make to be faithful to Christ. There's a similar passage in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. So Luke clarifies that that sacrifice has got to be one of daily and follow me. And there's even a similar passage again in Luke 14, verse 27. Well, let's look at an example of this. Look at Paul and just how much time that he initially wasted in his life. And uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9 and 10, Paul says there, For I am the least of the apostles, who am I not worthy to be called an apostle? Because I persecuted the church of God. That was the reason for Paul's humility. Verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly. How many times have I read through that, and I did not cross my mind. He labored more abundantly than the other apostles, but it was due to God's grace and because the position he was in before he obeyed the gospel. He continues, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So Paul puts God's grace in the forefront. He was an apostle equal to the others, but Paul carried with him this unworthiness. Also, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3, Peter writes there, For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking, parties, and abominable idolatries. But the time of foolishness has passed. So I mentioned about this term, redeeming our time. And I made it a point to go back and look, what does that mean in the original Greek? What was the original Greek word there? And I'm not going to try to pronounce the Greek word, but that word there in the Greek literally means ransom. And so what's implied by that? That our time has been taken captive or it's susceptible to being taken captive. And what Paul is saying there, you need to pay the ransom. Whatever it costs, you need to get your time back. It's that important. So with that time, not only is it valuable, but also our time here on this earth is limited. I think that's what makes it even more, all the more valuable. And in Job chapter 14, verse 1 and 2, Job says here, Man who is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. 
He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. This is from a prayer that Job is giving. Three limitations of the human being, born of woman, and by that, we're born in the flesh. Life is short, and life's full of turmoil. So just like Carl Sandburg said, Job is saying the same thing. Life's full of troubles. The psalmist would write in Psalms 90, verse 10, the days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they're 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off, and we fly away. So the longer we live, the harder life seems to be, and the years pass away quickly. In James chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such a city. Spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. So really, one here does not really take into account the uncertainty of life. Is there actually going to be a tomorrow? And do we take into account God's divine providence? Just by way of providence, does he say that there is going to be a tomorrow? But James here continues, Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is like a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. So we are really foolish to believe that we have control of our future. Life is fleeting, and inevitably, our life here on this earth is going to end, and we're going to be in a grave. So time is very valuable. Time is short here. So we need to make the best use of our time. So let's look at a few examples of um, our time being held captive by the cares of the world. One of the things that we're susceptible to is one of idleness. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 13, Paul writes there, And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies saying things which they ought not. So going house to house, they're wandering around without any kind of purpose. Of course, Paul here is speaking uh, about widows. And Paul was giving advice on not adding young women to the list of widows, not because they were in need, but the church was in need of widows for the work of the church. And that younger women would be more susceptible to the desires of remarriage and also a lack of discipline and Christian maturity. And he uses this as an example of idleness and wandering around from house to house. But certainly being idle is something that we don't need to be doing. Also, how about procrastination? In Proverbs chapter 27, verse 1, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. So there, true wisdom knows its limits. No one can control what happens tomorrow. And rather than procrastinating, if there's, a, if there's an opportunity for us to do what we need to do today, we need to go ahead and do that. Also how about lounging around. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 13, the writer writes there, do not love sleep lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes and you will be satisfied with bread. But that's the key there, don't love sleep. It doesn't mean that we need to have time to lounge, but don't love it. Don't let that be something that's going to control your life. It brings the lazy person poverty, and his or her behavior affects both the family as well as the community. Well, something else in terms of wasting our time, and this is something that I have to deal with from time to time as it relates to my job, and that is one of anxiety, or maybe I'd also put in the category that of stress, and how much of our time is wasted over worrying about something or stressing out over something. Well, in Matthew chapter 6, verse um, 25 through 34, Jesus speaks to his audience there about the subject of an anxiety and of worry. And in verse 26, he says, The birds of the air, they neither reap nor sow, but they're still fed. And in verse 28, The lilies in the field, they neither toil or spin. They, work, they don't worry. They're not tired. And yet they're provided for. And the point is God knows our needs, whatever those needs are. But in between verse 26 and 28, in verse 27, he says, Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? How can you add any span of time of your life by worrying? I think the New American Standard says, can add a single hour to his life. So how much time do we spend worrying about things that we don't have any control over, or by that it's going to increase any time for us in this life? But again, that's something that 
we're not truly redeeming our time. We're wasting our time in terms of that worry. How about brooding over the past? In Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, Paul speaks there about himself and about his past. And he says here, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So what did he forget? Well, in verses 4 through 6 of that same chapter, his credentials as a Jew, he had very high standing within the Jewish community. And he says here, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So he was very zealous in that position he held, and he gave all that up. Of course, he mentions there in verse 6 about persecuting the church. Something else I would think would probably weigh on him, and as we mentioned earlier, about his humility and his appreciation for the grace of God because of what he had done in the past. In verses 7 and 8, he speaks about his sacrifices as a Christian. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet, indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. And then in verse 12 there, as a Christian, he had not attained perfection. He had not really ultimately accomplished his purpose in this life. And he says, not that I have already attained or am already perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold of that of which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. So after Paul became a Christian, he did not dwell on the past. He did not allow the past to dominate his thoughts, and he did not permit the past to distract him from what he needed to do in the present. <clears throat> so Paul's a really good example of that about don't let our past interfere with our pathway and where we are going. Well, before we look at some of the things that are actually redeeming our time, <clears throat> it is important to know, <clears throat> excuse me, that we know our purpose. We need to know our purpose. If not, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to be like a boat without a sail. And the Bible is just replete with things concerning our purpose in this life, but just a few of them. Ecclesiastes 13, 12, we must fear God and obey his commandments. In Matthew 28, verse 19, make disciples of all the nations. Now, he's speaking there to the disciples, but why, by way of example, <clears throat> excuse me, we too should be out there proclaiming God's word. <clears throat> excuse me. And then John 15, 16, we must bear fruit. We must be spiritually productive. We must have a spiritually productive life. So by doing that, and by being imitators of Christ in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, it clarifies three things for us. <clears throat> Excuse me. First of all, it clarifies our priorities. We must buy up our time. We must pay that ransom to get our time back. Our time is limited, therefore it is valuable. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and, the right and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So we must seek first the kingdom of God. And also in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, this new start through Christ. And again, that of bearing fruit. So by doing that, it clarifies our priorities, but also by knowing our purpose, it clarifies our uncertainties. It gives us wisdom during time of uncertainties. We become a beacon of path for the world. And in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, you're the light of the world. People are looking for a way, a pathway to get through these troubles. And we, in part, provide that direction. And of course, it also clarifies during times of difficulties as we face these challenges in this life. We certainly can recall back to Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good of those who love God. So 
by us knowing that purpose in our life, that now we have a proper perspective to redeem our time. So what does that look like in terms of redeeming our time? Now, this is where me and Tyler have some similar points we're going to make here. But one of the things that we can say in terms of redeeming our time, and Tyler had mentioned this morning, is we need to spend that time studying the Word of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 5, verse 2, Paul writes there, Be diligent. Be conscientious in the discharge of your obligation, Timothy, to present yourself approved to God. We must show ourselves as genuine in terms of us being Christians. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. That word dividing there, the only other place that this is found in the Greek is in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And it's found in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6, and again in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 5. And where the term speaks, it speaks of a road or a pathway, building a straight pathway. And as we are dividing this word of truth, it's guiding us through this pathway that leads ultimately to our eternal reward. So we must study. That's how we redeem our time. Also, something else that Tyler mentioned this morning, and that is of prayer. And the same passage he mentioned, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, pray without ceasing. It expresses really one of devotion. Uh, we're looking toward God. It's a constant sense of God's presence and a sense of depending on God. So let's say something bad happens to us during the daytime. Who should we go to first? Call a friend, a family member? Why don't we go to God? What if something good happens in our life? Do we share that with a family or friend? Maybe we should go to God first and thank him. Those are the kind of things that um, Tyler was talking about this morning. Not only make that a habit, but then when things like this do happen in our lives, that really should be the first place that we should go. So also, in terms of redeeming our time, and that is seeking the lost. In Luke 15, there's three accounts there of seeking the lost. And in verses 3 through 7, we have the lost sheep and how the shepherd leaves the 99 to go out to find that one and how important that one is that he would leave those 99. And then verses 8 through 10, we have the lost coin and how this woman takes the time to sweep through her entire house to find this one coin. And of course, we have the prodigal son. That word prodigal means wasteful and lavish lifestyle, and yet this prodigal son that goes off and wastes his inheritance, and yet we see the father out there looking for him. So all three of these uh, parables here, the theme there is looking, and we need to be looking too. And in each of those situations, each of those situations that we have here, that when it was found, there was, one of, there was a time of celebration. And so for us, in terms of redeeming our time as we find opportunities that we can proclaim the gospel to others. We need to make sure that we have that opportunity. We're prepared to do that, and as we find those opportunities, we do it. Well, also, in terms of our redeeming time, it's also a time of self-examination. Okay, I want to check the clock here. I want to make sure I'm out by six, so. But one of self-examination. Very similar, I would think, probably to meditation that... Uh, Tyler was speaking about this morning. Not only do we meditate upon the word, but it's a time of self-examination of ourselves. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, we must examine, he says here, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? So the Corinthians had demanded proof of Paul's apostleship there in 2 Corinthians chapters 3 through 5. But Paul turns around and tells him they too were to test their lives with an earnest desire to conform to the faith. And even in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 28, we're to examine ourselves during the Lord's Supper. Examine ourselves based on what that bread and what that cup represents. And do we fully have an appreciation for what Christ has done for us? And how are we living our lives? So certainly in redeeming our, li or redeeming our time, it should be a time of self-examination. Two other points here, real briefly. And one is earning a living or supporting the family. 
1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8 says here, but if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So there's responsibilities for the household in terms of supporting not only the immediate family, maybe a spouse, children, maybe parents who may be living with you, but before that, he says, provide for his own. That's the extended family. If there's opportunities there that we can help provide for them, we need to do that. And he concludes by saying there, he's the one that does not do that, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So here, you find someone that may no neglect one's responsibility. That's counter to go back to, to ancient society. Honor your father and mother. Going back to Exodus 20, verse 10, and then again in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. But it's one of the original Ten Commandments. It's one of the oldest examples of the law of civil society in terms of preservation of the family. And how sad that... In this day and age, there's a lot, of, particularly men, that are not doing that. But the Bible specifically says you're neglecting your responsibility. But not just that. Someone that does not support their family, they're neglecting the faith. They show a lack of love. They're worse than an unbeliever. It was a given, even among the unbelievers, that it was right and good to provide for the family. And for someone who professes to be a Christian and they don't support that, why Paul there says, you're worse than an unbeliever. Even the unbelievers believe something along those lines. And then finally, one last point, and I guess we could really go on in terms of redeeming our time, but um, one last thing here, and that would be training our children. And in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, Paul writes there, and you fathers do not provoke, you know, don't rouse the, the wrath of your kids or anger. In fact, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 21, there's a similar passage there and he says that they will not lose heart that they wouldn't that you don't treat them unfair and they become discouraged but he says here fathers do not provoke your children to wrath but bring them up in the training and admonition of the lords so that word training there it's one of guidance it's cultivating the mind and the morals but not only are you training them, but during that time of training, if they don't understand it, and there needs to be a little more emphasis on that, then there's a time of admonition. The Greek word here implies that there's a problem in receiving the training, and it must be resolved. Similar passage there in, in uh, the Law of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. So just a few items there on redeeming our time. I can't tell you the number of times I read through that passage. I didn't really think about it. And it just happened to be one day I thought, redeeming, what does that mean in the Greek? And out of that, what all can be said? Sermon this morning, and then what we've looked at this evening on redeeming our time. Again, our time's very important, and we need to make sure that we are very good stewards of that time. Again, time is limited, and there's a lot out there that we need to do. So this evening, we offer the invitation to you if there's a person here who's not a Christian, uh, maybe you're interested in studying the Word of God. We certainly have people here willing and ready to help you on that endeavor. If you know what you need to do and you're ready to put your Lord on in baptism, we're certainly here ready and willing to help you. If you're an unfaithful child of God, you need to come back to your first love. As James 5.16 says, you know, confessing your sins to one another, praying for one another. Or if it's just simply you're going through a difficult time, you need the prayers of the congregation, we're certainly also here willing and ready to help you. So whatever your need may be, we'd ask you please come forward as we stand and as we sing.